In a couple of previous videos in this series about the Altair 680, we were able to get the Flex operating system up and running on this computer. Now the Flex operating system is essentially the CPM of the 6800 world. There was never a commercial uh, distribution of Flex available for this machine because there was never a disk drive or disk controller made for the Altair 680. However, we were able to get this drive cabinet you see right here working. This is a Pertec 3712. It's a dual eight inch drive cabinet, uh, IBM compatible. And the reason we can get it working is that it actually has a soft sector controller built right into this cabinet. And the only thing it requires back in the host computer is a parallel interface board, which is not uncommon to have for most computers. And there was a parallel interface board available for the 680 as well. And that you see right here on top. And those two connectors in the back, the ribbon cables, those are our parallel ports going to this drive cabinet. Now, if you take a look at the card stack we have in here, we have that interface board on top. And then below that are two 16K boards. And at this point, this computer is maxed out. That's the extent of what we can do with that uh, riser you see there. So 32K is our maximum memory configuration in this machine when we have that third card in there to hook to the disk drive. Um, and because of this limitation, I was uh, pretty much forced to go with an early version of Flex called Flex 1.0 or Mini Flex. Because it's the only version of Flex that ran without requiring RAM in the upper 32K of the memory space. Now, I would have liked to run a newer version of Flex. They were much more widely adopted. Therefore, there's a lot more software available for them. Um, and unfortunately, there is just no backward compatibility between a, a Flex 2 app application and one for Flex 1. So unfortunately, you're pretty much stuck with whatever was done for Flex 1. And as the market moved on to Flex 2, they pretty much just forgot Flex 1. It wasn't like people were hobbyists wanting to maintain it back at that point. But what we're going to do in the video today is upgrade the memory in this card, which will allow us, excuse me, in this computer, which will allow us to upgrade the operating system in it as well. We're going to do that with this memory card you see here. This was actually created by a modern day hobbyist. It's got a total of 64K on it, um, 32K by eight in each of those two RAM chips right there. Now we can't really use the entire 64K because the upper 4K of memory from F1000 through FFF is um, used for uh, IO devices and the PROMs on our main board. But anyway, with this memory board, we have enough RAM to run a newer version of Flex. And let's take a look at how that memory organization is done. Over on the left, you can see the memory organization of a Flex 1 system. The Flex image itself occupies a 4K block from 7000 through 8000 hex. And below that in white down to zero is memory for uh, user programs. In the middle, you can see a Flex 2 system memory layout. Flex itself is now an 8K block at 8000 through C1000. And again, down below that in white to zero is the area that can be used for user programs. Now, another major change that came along with Flex 2 was a move to 256 byte sectors instead of 128 byte. This gave them about 11% more capacity on their five and a quarter inch disk drives that they used. Now, unfortunately, I cannot change sector size on the FD3712. I have to stick with the IBM format of 128 byte sectors. So I'm going to have to combine two physical sectors to make a single 256 byte logical sector that will keep Flex happy. All right, so I have 26 sectors per track. That means I'll have 13 logical sectors as you see here on the right. So for logical sector one, that maps to physical sectors two and four. Logical sector two reads log physical sectors three and five. Now you notice I've skipped a sector in here. And the reason is because you cannot read two physical sectors in a row on the 3712 disk controller uh, without slipping a full revolution. So in other words, to read the 228 byte sectors if they were consecutive would take two revolutions. But by putting a gap in between of one sector time, I can read the two sectors in just one revolution. So that will greatly improve performance. Now I do have 13 logical sectors. That means one pair, since it's odd, is gonna have to be consecutive. And you can look down there at the bottom and see that 26 and one are technically consecutive. However, sector 26 on the disk is followed by a lot of free space uh, to allow for speed variances in the disk drives. And that amounts to about two sector times. So I'm actually able to read sector 26 and one in one revolution, even though they're technically consecutive. In the end, we're gonna actually port Flex 3.0 to our Altair 680 as opposed to Flex 2.0. 
Two operating systems are essentially identical. The real difference is that Flex 3 was designed to be easier to port to hardware platforms other than the Southwest technical computers. And they did this by moving all the hardware specific code out of Flex itself and putting that into two different files. One of those is the disk driver file, of course, that you might expect. And then the other is a file to handle console IO and they call that the console driver. Now in the console driver, there are also routines for supporting a hardware timer should there be one in your computer. The hardware timer would be used to support the, uh, the print spool or background printing feature that Flex has. Now you notice there is no reference here to printer drivers or to printer IO, and that's because that had already been separated even back in the Flex 1 days into the print.sys file. And that's covered in the user manual that the end user would get with Flex. So in the end, our job will be to create those two files, the printer, excuse me, the disk driver file for our FD3712, and then the console driver file to support the serial port that talks to our terminal interface for the, for the operator. In order to write the disk drivers and the console drivers and then create a version of Flex that will run on the Saltair 680, I'm going to go ahead and use my Southwest Technical 6800 computer to do this. I have a version of Flex 3 that was an off-the-shelf solution, so that's a good starting point. Let me go ahead and just boot that. It's going to ask for the date here in just a second. All right, so on this disk are all the files that came with the Flex 3 distribution, along with some utilities I like. And so this will be a great place to have all the files I need to put on to the version for the Altair 680. Now I won't be able to just do a nice disk to disk copy because the two disk systems are completely incompatible with each other. So I'm gonna have to use serial ports to do that. We're gonna look more of that later. The other thing that's on here that's important is the actual Flex3 memory image files. So this flex3-tb.sys, that is the actual Flex image that was booted when I hit that D command earlier. It includes the console drivers and the disk drivers that were specific to the 6800 computer. This flex3.core, that is the flex3 memory image without the disk driver and without the console drivers. So to make a version for the 680, all I really have to do is take this flex3.core, combine it with my console drivers and with my disk drivers, and then those together would be a complete flex3 bootable memory image that would be for the 680. All right, so I've got the console driver for the 680 written, and I've got the disk driver for the 680 written. They're on this computer. Let me go ahead and just assemble them, and that'll give us a listing. Let's do the console driver first. And we'll take a look at it as it scrolls by. All right, so here's the jump table that is the disk drive, excuse me, is the driver that is required in the console file that you, you create. Now, if you'll notice down here is to init the serial, uh, check the status to see if a character is present, output the character, and input a character with echo. And way up here at the bottom is another one that's input a character with no echo. So those five entry points represent console I.O. These other ones here in the middle these are interrupt routines and execution routines for manipulating a timer board that you might have in your computer, all for handling the um, print spooler that Flex supported. Print spooler would run in the background, continuing to print while you were in the foreground using the computer as normal. Now I don't have a hardware um, timer inside the 680, so everything I have in here is basically not doing anything. All right, so the initialization entry point just initializes the two of uh, the ACIA as you'd expect, and the rest of this is input, output, and that's basically it. Now, another thing that's in this file is where you specify the end of memory. In Flex 2, it would search through memory for the end, but on any given hardware system, you can't know whether that's safe to do or not because you'll hit I.O. devices in 6800 because they're all memory mapped. So here you can actually specify the end of RAM. So I have it at 9FF. F, right below the 8,000 um, uh, starting point of, uh, of Flex. All right, so let's go ahead and assemble the disk driver as well. Now this disk driver for the most part was very, very similar to what I wrote for Flex 1. The main difference is that I had to read two sectors per call, 228 byte sectors to make up a physical 
I mean, a logical 256 bytes vector. That was the main difference. And then the other thing is we'll see here in the jump table in just a second that they added a couple of more entry points. All right, so this is the jump table into the driver routines. Same as before, read, write, verify, restore, and select drive. That's all the same. Then they added two more check for ready entry points, which used to be done by the drive select routine. They've broken it out to give them a little more flexibility in that. In the case of this particular controller, it's all the same as the original drive select routine. So you see those are all the same. They then also provided a cold start and a warm start entry point, just so that any given hardware configuration could work without Flex itself having to know about it. Um, I don't have to do anything on cold start. We'll take a look at what warm start does in a minute. And finally, they added a seek to track routine, which I don't do anything with it here because it's not used by Flex. They don't expose an entry vector to it down on the normal spots where you jump into Flex. Um, the only way to call it would be jump to this address directly. And the only thing I've seen that uses that is their Flex 3 version of new disk, the skeleton code that they recommend you fill out. And it uses that to step instead of using the hardware directly. But you're already calling the hardware directly to format it and stuff, so I, I didn't bother implementing that one last point. All right, so the rest of this, um, oh yeah, let's take a look at this warm init. So I'm actually doing an initialization for the console IO routine because there's not a warm start entry point in the console driver, but I need one. And the reason is because there's a bug in the 6800 monitor. It enables hardware interrupts in the UART. However, it is running, whenever you hit reset, the 6800 itself has the interrupts disabled. That's what happens when you come out and reset. So they never notice this as being a problem. However, if you then enter software like Flex that enables interrupts by clearing the interrupt flag in the 6800, then when a character comes in, it's gonna jump to an interrupt routine that's not there to support the ACIA. So that's bad news. So what I do here on Warm Start, which is also called on the very first cold start, is uh, turn the hardware interrupts in the UART off. Now I had to do it in Warm Start because anytime you drop into the monitor with the mon command, then the monitor has re-enabled those interrupts in the UART again. And so you have to come back in here because it does a warm start whenever you exit the monitor and come back into Flex. So anyway, oddly enough, this is the only place I could put it, but it was specific to the 680, so I've got it in this file. All right, so here's the read sector routine. As before, it does a seek, and then it does a read sector, and normally it would be done here, but now we load the second physical sector and go read that as well. So you can see we're just reading the two sectors instead of one. Uh, seek routine is basically the same. Right um, sector that you see right here, again, instead of just doing the one read, we now come in and read the second physical sector as well. Same applies to the verify sector that you see here. All right, the rest of this routine is basically the same. And then here at the end, you can see the sector table that we just got through looking at where logical sector one gives us physical sectors two and four, logical sector two gives us physical sectors three and five, etc. All right, so at this point, I have got uh, a .bin file. Um, if you take a look at this from these assemblies, I've got the um, console driver binary and the disk driver binary. So what I want to do that now is combine that with the flex.core file to make a system file that, for the Altair 680. You do that with the append command. Append lets you put multiple binary files together. So I'll take flex.core, wait, no, that's flex3.core and the disk driver and the console driver and then we'll put those all into let's call it flex3 680.sys so that we know it's not the one for this computer so this will combine all three of these console driver dot bin the last statement was the entry address of flex which is ad hundred so this will automatically become the entry address for the whole new system all right, so now we've got that file out here as well. Here's our flex380.sys. And this is the version of flex that if we loaded it into memory on the 680, it should run. So with the flex3 memory image that I need to run on the Altair 680, sitting in the file system of this Southwest Technical 6800 computer, how do I go about getting that loaded into memory on the 680 so that I can start running Flex and start building a disk? Well, the only option I have for loading files into this 680 computer right now 
is going to be with S records going through the ROM monitor in the 680. Now you might recall there's a, a load command in the prompt monitor to load S records. If I type L, it is now expecting S records to come through the console port, which would have been a paper tape reader in the day. I mean, I can even end it by typing the S9 and then it thinks it's all done. So how can I use that to get data from the uh, 6800 computer? Well, what I'm gonna do is issue that L command and then with this AB switch over here, I'm gonna switch to B, which will take console input to the 680 from a serial port over here in my Altair, excuse me, in the 6800 computer. And I've written a utility called send S19 that will send um, a binary file out through that serial, second serial port as an S record file. All right, so let's go back here and just watch this all happen. So I'm the type of load here. So now it's expecting stuff to come through the console serial port. I will set the console serial port to come from B, which is the serial port on this 6800 computer. So now I'll run the little transfer program, send um, S19 flex 3680.sys is the file we want to send. Now it's going to uh, send it through the serial port, but also echo it here on the screen so I can see how it's coming by. The reason I want to do that is because we're not going to see it on the screen here, because right now this terminal is disconnected, and the data for the load command is actually coming from this computer, so this is what's being sent over. Okay, so that's all done. So if I come over here to this computer now and set the switch back to A, let's take a look at the monitor. Hopefully what we'll see when I hit return is that we're at the dot prompt, and we are. That means it loaded. All right, so now I should be able to jump to the cold start entry address of Flex, which should be in memory at AD00. And there we are, Flex 3.0, asking for the date, 11, 28, 22. It's been a day, huh? All right, and there we are, we're up in Flex. Now, can't do anything because I have no disk. All commands basically for Flex come off the disk other than the monitor command. And it looks like that one works. I can jump back into Flex, but other than that, there's not much of anything I can do. So now we're going to do the whole chicken and egg process of uh, trying to get a disk built with a disk that we can't actually even write to yet um, or any programs. So that's what we'll start addressing in the next video. This particular one's long enough. We'll pick up right here and in the next video show you how we go building a disk.